started. Uh, welcome all to the session in room A here for how to teach students to use generative artificial intelligence responsibly, lessons from clinical psychology. Please mute yourself and put any questions you have in the chat with the letter Q in front to make it easy to distinguish questions from comments. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And now let me turn it over to our esteemed presenter, Amanda Draheim from Goucher College. Amanda. Hello, thank you, everyone. Um, so yes, this is the title that Gen AI gave to me. It's a little more confident than I am, but um, this is how I have been teaching about promoting ethical decision making in the context of Gen AI, um, informed by my experiences uh, through my training in clinical psychology, and more specifically in motivational interviewing. So to start off, um, the uh, Dr. Ling has talked about a number of different efforts that folks are making in response to Gen AI. Um, and this can include school-wide bans, policies prohibiting the use of Gen AI, um, or attempts to chat GPT-proof assignments and things like that. Um, my insights from the literature on motivational interviewing suggests that while there is a time and a place for instructing students when not to use Gen AI, um, how we communicate that message can actually backfire. Um, in particular, there's research in motivational interviewing um, from early in Miller's career, um, exploring the way that different confrontational approaches can um, send people in the opposite direction of where you want them to go. So this is coming from traditional treatments for substance use disorders, and uh, many clinicians have this writing reflex, this tendency to want to tell clients, you need to stop drinking, here's how you do it. Um, and if people are experiencing ambivalence about their drinking or their substance use behaviors, then because I'm being told what to do, I'm going to do the exact opposite. And that can make some intuitive sense, right? Um, my thinking is that with Gen AI, this is another situation in which students may be experiencing some ambivalence about whether or not they want to use generative artificial intelligence, if they want to use it in ways that might be considered ethical or not. And if they're just simply being told, no, you can't use this tool, um, they may react in a negative way um, and choose to do the exact opposite simply because they're being told not to use it. Um, as an alternative, Miller and colleagues found that more empathic approaches um, that responded to this ambivalence with empathy uh, were more effective in terms of clients who were reducing their substance use and maintaining that reduction over time. And the idea behind this is that people are going to be most convinced by themselves and their own ideas. So what happens in motivational interviewing is we encourage clients to identify their own internal motivations for change, and we reinforce those motivations. Um, anytime we catch any change talk, so for students this might be, well, you know, I really want to promote my own learning, then um, that is something that's going to be reinforced, that's going to be reflected. We're going to repeat their words back to them. Um, and when students say, well, you know, I'm so stressed and I'm so crunched for time, um, I, I'm just going to turn to what works, we can respond to that with empathy. And um, in terms of treatment for substance use disorder, this has been shown to be a much more effective approach with long-term benefits. A little bit more about what motivational interviewing is. Um, so there are techniques that I was talking about, so reinforcing change talk, empathizing with um, sustained talk. We also have things like decisional balance approaches where people explore their ambivalence, um, importance and confidence rulers, things like that that I'll be um, illustrating later. Um, but more importantly, there's a spirit of motivational interviewing. And the spirit of motivational interviewing is an empathic one where we are not directing the clients or as teachers, um, there are limits to the extent to to which we are directing our students. Rather, we are collaborating with our students. We are working together to explore how we want to embark upon this education experience together. Um, for motivational interviewing, it's a very brief intervention. It happens in one to four sessions with long-term effects. And my thought is that maybe motivational interviewing can represent a useful framework for promoting the ethical use of generative artificial intelligence. And this is how I've been doing that. 
Uh, some additional benefits of motivational interviewing that I want to mention before I dive into that is that motivational interviewing approaches have been shown to be particularly effective for members of minoritized populations. Um, often we see that traditional treatments may be less effective for members of minoritized populations. So this is um, really a really cool finding that we've been seeing in the literature. And my hypothesis behind it is that that empathic approach um, where we're really respecting clients as agents of change and experts in their own lived experiences has that cultural humility element that can um, improve their um, sense of empowerment and agency. And that's something that we would want to offer for our students as well. Um, there's also some indications out there that medical practitioners who get trained in motivational interviewing experience less burnout. Um, and this can come from um, feeling as though they are collaborating with their clients rather than taking on all the responsibility of telling their, their patients what to do. Um, and so I think that maybe there could be a similar benefit for us instructors and teachers as well. So I hoped to, I attempted to design a class that's informed by motivational interviewing to encourage students to apply ethical principles to how they decide when and how to use generative artificial intelligence. Um, all of these materials are freely available on my teaching portfolio. There will be a QR code for that at the end of my presentation. So some things that we did in my class. Uh, this is a psychological distress and disorders class that I was teaching. I'm at Goucher College. It's small, so the, the class size is 24 students. It's a 70-minute class. Um, the students were instructed to read before class um, the APA Ethical Code of Conduct. And so we started class with defining these concepts and providing some examples of how they are um, honored in different research practices through institutional review boards and informed consent processes and things like that. Um, I also wanted to promote elaborative encoding. So some of these connections that Dr. Lane was talking about by making connections to previous classes. When we talked about the history of clinical psychology, we talked about the role that clinical psychologists played in contributing to eugenics and conversion therapy as well. And so I encourage students to think through which of these ethical principles were violated um, in particular uh, through these harmful practices. And inspired by Dr. Annalise Singh's Racial Healing Handbook, I also wanted to um, make some new connections to a learning outcome for my class, appreciating the import of cultural humility um, by asking students to consider what these psychologists needed to understand that they were causing harm, to understand that they were engaging in unethical behavior. And so we talked about Harrow's um, cycle of socialization and how socialization can lead to these biased beliefs that contributed to psychologists engaging in these kinds of behaviors. Um, I also introduced some multicultural principles to go hand in hand with the APA code of conduct, also facilitating that value of, um, of cultural humility. And finally, we talked about Goucher's ethical values and the community principles. And students were to, I asked students to think about what ethical values in general were most important to them. This is all consistent with some practices that we use in motivational interviewing and other treatments like acceptance and commitment therapy, where when people are connected to their values, that gives them a sense of direction. They're more likely to be able to notice the discrepancy between their behaviors and their values and to engage in behaviors that are more consistent with who they want to be. So this pr promotes some of that, that um, growth, self-actualization, what have you. And finally, I wanted to give students some tools for how do we go from values to action? So I presented one example of an ethical decision-making model, and I talked about the importance of consultation before students engaged in a group activity where they practiced applying these um, ethical principles to a variety of different ethical dilemmas that are relevant to the field of clinical psychology. So one example dilemma involved um, if your boss, who is a deacon for his church, is accessing private clinical patient files to make his decisions about um, church functioning and his role as a deacon. So I asked students, which ethical principles are particularly relevant in these dilemma situations? Do any of them conflict with one another and what would you do? 
And finally, I had them complete an anonymous survey um, that is informed by motivational interviewing techniques, including a decisional balance where they weighed some of the reasons that they may have for ethical and unethical generative artificial intelligence use. I had them respond to importance and confidence meters. So what this is, is on a scale of zero to 10, how important is it to you to use generative artificial intelligence in ethical ways? And if you set a seven, why wasn't it a five? Why, why wasn't it a lower number? Um, and that can help people engage in some more of that change talk. And with the confidence ruler in particular, build some of their confidence and their ability to, in this case, use generative artificial intelligence in um in ethical ways. Um, and throughout this class, I was really hoping to embrace the spirit of motivational interviewing by radically accepting that students get to make their own choices about when and how to use generative artificial intelligence um, and wanting to give them the tools to make those decisions in an informed way. So I do have some results to share from you from those surveys. And of course, these are very limited. So 14 students consented, consented to having their data shared outside of the Goucher community. I do have IRB approval for that, um, that science communication. And most of the students indicated that they definitely not or probably would not use generative artificial intelligence when told not to, um, both in the pre and the post test for this survey. So this could suggest that maybe the backfire principle that I'm talking about doesn't apply, um, but I do have some more information about why they said that they were likely to use generative artificial intelligence um, when they would not use it when told not to. And some of these things were like lack of familiarity or some fear that they may accidentally plagiarize. So I think this really highlights that now is a really important time for us to be teaching students how to use generative artificial intelligence in the context of giving them the critical thinking skills to know how to do it ethically. Um, particularly given that these tools may be really important in their future careers. There were three students who indicated that they were likely to use generative artificial intelligence even when told not to. Um, what these are the their responses um, broken out into pretest and post post test for the first four and the and the last four respectively, um, and then the type of ins of assignment may matter. So I talked about how challenging and time consuming the assignments were in the questions. Um, overall, the mean score on the ratings did seem to decline somewhat from pretest to post-test. So maybe going through the survey actually increased the likelihood that they would choose not to use generative artificial intelligence when instructed not to. But with three students, I don't have you know statistical um, analyses to support that. And a lot of the reasons for why they may decide to use generative artificial intelligence when told not to went down to things like fear of failure, time pressure, things that in my mind make sense in the context of um, stress, anxiety, which we're seeing very high rates of among our college students. So um, with that in mind, uh, students also had a chance to give general feedback. And one of the most common things I saw was they wanted more direction about what is ethical use and what is not ethical use. So we did have a follow-up discussion about this. Um, and I highlighted how the practice that they did with the ethical dilemmas where they turn values into actions can also apply to their decisions about using gener generative artificial intelligence. Um, so take the these analyses with many grains of salt. Um, it's very small sample, limited generalizability, and what have you. Um, also keep in mind that motivational interviewing hasn't been evaluated in this application, and some research suggests that a certain level of training is required for effective motivational interviewing. I'm not sure how that might apply in this kind of context. Um, but I do have a number of different recommendations for how we can apply the spirit of motivational interviewing to our teaching, including things like using open-ended questions and empathy to promote an egalitarian relationship with our students and encourage them um, to make their decisions about how to use generative artificial intelligence. And I think a bigger picture is the more we can be doing to promote well-being among our students, teaching them skills to engage 
engage in work-life balance, um, sleep hygiene, things like that um, can be really important for um, promoting academic integrity, as well as challenging the message that students' sense of self-worth is dependent on their grades or their attendance or what have you. Um, I think that is a cultural message that may be reinforcing some of the stress that we're seeing among our students. So these are the class materials that I have on my teaching portfolio. Um, I will be adding the slides from this presentation to that page, um, and you'll have my contact information on that website as well. Um, so please feel free to follow up with me if you have additional questions, um, and please feel free to use, adopt, edit my class materials if they might helpful. Um, so I will come back to this slide, but I just wanted to say thank you to you all for attending today, and I will be very happy to um to take questions thank you uh, amanda um please put questions into the chat um i did have one quick one and that and you may have mentioned this but i didn't hear i well it's actually two parts one is the what were the age of your um of the people that you were working with the 14 that you worked with or 13 mm -hmm. or 14. Yeah, these are traditional undergraduate students. So the age range is going to be 18 to 22 or so. I do have the occasional post back student. Um, and uh, this class is a lower level course. Um, so we, I tend to see more um, sophomores and juniors. At that. I, I was wondering about that, whether it's traditional. Um, and we do have another question in the chat. Uh, um, do you think the smaller nature of the course made the message more significant? I have often heard individuals encouraging greater conversation about topics such as this at orientation, but worry it might lose some of its benefit on a mass scale. Mm, yeah, that's a fantastic question. I do think the smaller nature of the course probably um, influenced the design or how I talk about it or how I communicate about these things. Um, I have taught much larger courses. Um, and so that definitely influences how I teach and how I format my classes. So um, having these like smaller groups to go do the ethical dilemma activity, um, that is something that I think could work even in a class of one or 200 students. Um, and a lot of this was fairly lecture based. The piece that um, that might be more challenging is with the survey in future classes, I'm hoping to have this be more of a discussion rather than a survey. And so for that, some creativity around how to facilitate the um, confidence importance things, um, maybe that it would need to stay more in a survey context or have these questions in like a survey monkey that they can do on their phones or something during the session or what have you. Um, so yeah, adapting to the environment um, would definitely be warranted if you're in like an orientation session in particular um, in terms of, you know, presenting this is our community's values, um, maybe having some kind of a Slido for students to talk about what their values are and why, and then finding ways to connect that to different decisions that they may make in their college experience, for example. This is a really, very, all very good points. And good, it was, that is a, was a very good question. Um, thank you. And it looks like there's even been some follow-up with some uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, we are pretty much at time. Um, we did try to, like, so we're trying to get to as many questions. You can always send them later to any of the coordinators and we may be able to connect with some of the presenters.